Welcome to Today in Space. We're back for another episode here on the All Things Space Science Podcast. We have to talk about the aurora that just happened. It took the internet, it took the news, everyone was talking about it, and I got plenty of pictures from folks like you overnight when it was happening that first day. Got some questions from you. Let's talk about the aurora, what it is, where it comes from, and why it's happening, and how you can be on the lookout the next time we have this once-in-a-lifetime chance, like we did with this G5 geomagnetic storm. Welcome to Today in Space. Let's dive in. All right, folks. So, welcome to Today in Space. I'm your space science podcast host from the East Coast, Alex G. Orfanos. We're talking about auroras. So you probably caught it. I know a lot of folks missed it on that first night where we just had so many pictures coming around the world from places like Spain and Europe. And we also had people as far south as Florida, Georgia. Tons of folks were able to catch the auroras. But what was it? You know, auroras are a really interesting thing that are unique to planets that have atmospheres like ours and have magnetospheres like ours do, right? We have an iron core on our planet, which means we have a magnetic field around the planet. And when solar weather happens, you get energetic particles that fly from the sun, solar wind, as you may have heard of it, and that interacts with our atmosphere, with our magnetosphere, and... There is this whole back and forth, this whole dynamic thing that's happening in the void of space due to our sun and everything else around it. You know, one of the things that's really not talked about often is that our sun has a cycle and seasons. And, you know, the sun has, as as we calculate it, an 11-year cycle. And in that period, the magnetic field on the sun is flipping uh, at, at by the end of these. So after two cycles, you're back to the same magnetic field. And remember, the sun is a giant fusion ball in the sky that sometimes doesn't go perfectly, right? It's This is the real world. Things aren't perfect all the time. And these sunspots, these disturbances, these concentrations of magnetism and energy create these sunspots. And this sunspot was active enough that it sent five to seven of these from this sunspot that was basically throwing energized particles out into space, reaching Earth. And that's how we found out about it. I remember I was on Twitter. I follow NOAA, the NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration that tracks these things, right? It actually tracks space weather. I follow a lot of these accounts because I'm active on space and I want to communicate space and, and, and learn. And so I would highly suggest following the NOAA. It's a U.S. organization. If you're a taxpayer, your money is going towards this, towards space weather and detection. Now, I remember watching it on Twitter, where all of a sudden there was, hey, there's this solar flare, and then all of a sudden I started seeing activity from, in my feed, from NOAA and other people that follow this, many folks that are smarter than me, which is always a good thing uh, to follow people that are smarter than you because you learn things, but space is is such an interesting thing where so many people are aware of it. Events like the auroras now are what bring us all together in, in a weird human way, but you know, it's not like the Weather Channel, where every news station has a Weather Channel for each locality, and you're able to know what the weather is that day to a certain, you know, degree of accuracy. Space weather requires a whole other uh, aspect of it, and it and it brings our our really our first question, thanks to our friend the Ann Bag, because we were asking for people and their curiosity. Right, everyone saw it. Were there any questions? And Ann's question here is, number one, is there a way to have a better prediction of these auroras? I had no clue was happening until after and missed it. Same here, Anne. Then the day after the news where everything was full of it. And number two, how likely is it to happen again? 
if we look at the NOAA page, they actually have a little bit on forecasting the aurora and the different time scales that it can be done. Obviously, we talked about the solar scale, 11 years, 27 days is also another time period uh, and that's you know depending on the active regions and the coronal holes that we're seeing they can last months but more interesting in the hours to days period there's the ability to predict geomagnetic activity and aurora by detecting solar coronal holes and CMEs near the sun and this is where we saw the first evidence of this aurora and then it looks like as little as 15 to 45 minutes, we're able to get updates on what the auroras will be. And these are by these instruments and satellites that are at this point 1.5 million kilometers or a million miles from Earth towards the sun. And this is called the first Lagrangian orbital location, or people will typically call it L1. And these Lagrange points are these different places where the gravity ends up balancing out between the sun and earth. And so it's a really good place to put a spacecraft. And so we basically, within a million miles from earth, we're able to detect what that speeding solar wind and solar weather is doing, and that will help us update it. But it also makes it difficult for something like this, where you basically are waiting for the solar weather to reach us uh, within the 15 to 45 minute range. And I think that's why a lot of us ended up missing that second round was because by the time we realized when it was going to get here, uh, it had already arrived. And it was before anything, everything got dark enough for most of us to see. So the, the show happened to be over before uh, it could be. So Basically, in order for us to get better at that, we would need more devices and we probably need a better understanding of how to predict when these coronal mass ejections and solar weather and storms are going to happen. And the more we look at the sun, the more we observe these things, the better we'll get at it. More spacecraft would also help as well. This podcast is brought to you by EG 3D Printing. It is our 3D printing lab here where we bring ideas into reality. We have our Instagram page, EG 3D Printing, where you can see all the things we've made over the years. It's kind of astounding to think how many things we've made already with our 3D printers, but we have our little robotic buddies that we literally print so many different things and it's available for you if you have a project. I know there's a lot of folks who are in college who sometimes those labs get busy and especially around finals time and end of the year and you've got a project and something you've got to make, reach out to us. If you can e if you email us from your school email, we'll give you a 25% discount for all students. Um, but if you're just someone who wants to get something 3D printed or you know want to start your first project and you're wondering if 3D printing is the right thing for you, we will give you a free quote. And if 3D printing isn't the best way for you to make whatever you're making, we'll let you know and we'll point you in the right direction on where to go. But we're here to help bring your own ideas into reality. We've got our friends like over at Snapcaller and others who've had ideas for businesses. We've helped them prototype those first models so they, they have the idea and they have it in their hands. That's, that's the power of 3D printing is is literally bringing an idea into reality rapidly. And it's all about this iterative approach and stuff. But but you don't have to do the work. We will do the work. We're the experts here on the 3D printing side of things. So we'd be happy to help you with your next project. So go to ag3d-printing.com. There's a form there. Fill it out. You can get a free quote from us. You can email us at ag3d.engineering at gmail.com. And of course, Follow us online at AG3D Printing, at Instagram, and AG3D Printing Lab over on TikTok. And don't forget, if you're looking for a gift for a nerd in your life, we've got a ton of stuff already designed and ready to print on demand at our Etsy shop, ag3dprinting.etsy.com. And now, back to the show. So many people were able to jump on this opportunity, and I, like I said, I was getting ready for bed. I was up late, but I was getting ready for bed and I had people texting me pictures from up in Maine to locally here in Massachusetts, even in the outer skirts of the city with the, with the right settings on your cell phone, you could see it. And it was, it was really 
really fun to see so many people get interested and go out and look up. I mean, that's, that is such a cool thing in today's age that we got so many people to go outside and, and try and stay up for it. You know, these solar particles that are emitting from the sun, they're in these like bubbles that are flying at crazy speeds and eventually impact the atmosphere here. And you're kind of, those auroras are just basically the solar wind, this intense storm of energetic particles that are basically making these oxygen and nitrogen atoms glow because they're gaining the energy. They're, they're interacting with these particles and literally glowing from it. That's what you're seeing. And, you know, our eyes, just for the same reason why we can't see most nebulas while we look at the sky, like our eyes are just not built for that. We're built for surviving, you know, in the wilderness and, and seeing a completely different thing here on earth. Uh, so like our eyes can't do it, but our cell phones, different aperture, different way that it's experiencing light. And so that's why people were able to see and capture all these photos. But in real life, the auroras typically kind of lack the, 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 the luster that everyone thinks they're going to see like they saw with all the pictures, and it, it really is more like a hue or a, a light glow. But even that, our eyes are still picking up, especially on this G5 intense solar storm. We're picking up these oxygen and nitrogen atoms glowing from the charge from this solar storm. The excited oxygen, the pinks and the greens, and then you have the ionized molecular nitrogen, which is lower in the atmosphere. That's your blues and your purples. And so that mix that you're seeing in the sky is a reflection of the sun matter hitting the atmosphere and, and lighting it up and exchanging that energy with ours. Now, one of the things that's really interesting about all of that is like SpaceX had a planned launch that same uh, day and then weekend and chose to launch later over the weekend in order to avoid that. You know, earlier, a year or two ago, SpaceX had just launched some Starlink satellites and had many of them, uh, almost the, well, the majority of the ones they had just launched had to be deorbited because all of that energy basically destroyed those satellites. And so on Earth, in our atmosphere, we were safe, but... Anything else in space, including astronauts, including, you know, depending on where you were at a certain time, for anything in space, without the protective barrier of the atmosphere, they were going to experience a bad time. And that brings up a really, a really important thing about extending human life into space, of working and living every single day in space and getting to a place where we can do that. The reality is, is that there is a, uh, space weather is crazy. Space weather is really messed up. And if you really go out there and you go past our little cozy solar system and even certain parts of our solar system, there is some really messed up stuff that you can interact. You know, particles moving at light speed relative to you, you wouldn't even know if a particle impacted you or went through. It would just happen and there's there's... There's no, <laughs> there's nothing really out there right now aside from being like in a lead box that's going to be solid protection for you. But there's a lot of things that are being done to protect astronauts. The Artemis II mission that's coming up that's going to be sending the first woman and the first person of color to orbit the moon for the first time and also the first Canadian. And on that mission, on the Orion capsule, they actually have a compartment where the team is going to enter if they experience radiation in space, which could very well be from our sun. Uh, just simply the space weather of our sun, right? Mars, for instance, used to have an atmosphere, and one of the theories behind why Mars has become this dusty, you know, rusty, cold planet that used to harbor life. Clearly, you know, there's signs of water and methane, but what happened to it? And a lot of those early ideas is that 
at a certain point, the atmosphere basically got blown off of Mars because of extreme solar activity. And that's one of the things that is happening when we're seeing an aurora. Luckily, our magnetosphere helps keep so much of our atmosphere together, but it does interact when there are solar emissions and and solar stuff like this that does happen. It's important to consider that if there's one that's bad enough, it could literally diminish our atmosphere. So radiation in space is not great, but as far as those auroras and what we experienced, even the most severe solar storm we've experienced since 2005, going to space and living out there is going to be much more of a challenge than we no, and, and there's so many th- different things that we can do. You know, we were able to speak with some folks here on the podcast, like, for instance, Madison Fian of Space Copy, right, is looking to put 3D printers on the moon and use the dust on that place in an extreme environment to 3D print with the soil of the moon, which is a natural defender against solar radiation, it would be the same thing on Mars. If we could figure out how to use something that's already there, that's already a resource that there's a ton of on wherever we're going, we don't have to spend the money and the time to develop crazy different materials and technologies and manufacturing methods to make this radiation blanketing and all this stuff using the soil, the regolith as they call it, at the place that you're going to be experiencing this extreme environment. That is a whole nother level of just being resourceful, but also smart with our time and our energy. And it and it, it opens up so many different doors. So we can't wait to see what more people like Madison and Space Copy and 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 so many different others that are looking at ways to help people survive in space and All of that stuff ends up trickling back to us here on Earth to help make our lives here better. And although we hope we don't have to, but to also someday adapt when and if the environment gets to a point where we need to start defending against solar radiation because so much of it has happened and our atmosphere has taken such a beating that it changes the way that we live here on Earth. But We hope that we're able to learn enough about surviving in space to apply that here on Earth so we don't have to get to that that point. And maybe one day we'll be living on Mars and figure out a way to restore the atmosphere on Mars, which could then help us keep things good here on Earth. But that's in the distant future, and there's a lot to be done here today, so... That's our episode here in the Auroras. We hope we answered some of your questions and helped you understand a little bit more about what you were seeing and why it was such a spectacular event. If you were able to see the Aurora, we'd love to see your pictures. Send us an email, todayinspacepodcast at gmail.com. Hit us up on all our social media, Today in Space Pod, on Instagram and Twitter. There's Today in Space on TikTok. And then, of course, emailing us at Today in Space podcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. We hope you have a good rest of your week. Spread love and spread science. And we'll see you in the next episode of Today in Space. Be well.